Uh, good afternoon. Small group, right before lunch. Uh, I'll promise uh, to make sure I don't stand in the way too much. Um, NLAX has been present in, uh, in Poland for quite some time now. Uh, we have a point of presence in, uh, in Warsaw. And uh, the reason of uh, this presentation is to talk a little bit more about interconnection. And um, it's a word what's, what's been used a lot in the data center community, in the network community, but what does it really mean uh, for buyers of network services? What does it mean for uh, sellers of uh, uh, content services and so on? So I uh, hope you bear with me. Uh, there'll be some room for some questions afterwards. But uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce a little bit more about uh, NLAX. Um, NLAX was founded in the Netherlands in 2002 and we started our life as an internet exchange, uh, basically competing with M6, uh, which at that point was limited in its scope <coughs> to service the Amsterdam metro area. Um, there was demand from data centers outside the Amsterdam region and NLAX filled that gap by building pops outside of Amsterdam and pretty much uh, filling the Benelux in, in a short period of time and providing peering services. Uh, this expanded into Europe, uh, where we now have uh, coverage in more than 15, uh, 15 countries and uh, more than uh, 25 uh, cities. Uh, we're in uh, 105 data centers at the moment, and we connect about 655 customers. Um, on the peering VLAN, uh, which is one distributed VLAN across Europe, uh, we push approximately 1.7, 1.8 terabits of traffic at peak levels. And um, um, gradually, uh, between 2002 and, and, and 2017, uh, we started developing other services, uh, basically because our customers asked us uh, to provide them for us. Um, this was driven mostly in the Netherlands because we were in uh, lower density carry neutral data centers outside of Amsterdam. Um, so in some cases, we were the only transit provider there. Uh, or we were the only provider that had a backbone that extended into other cities in, in, in Europe. And we were asked, and it's an engineering company at heart, so we never really said no to these customers. Um, we focus on wholesale and wholetail. Wholetail is a marketing word <laughs> um, between wholesale and retail. Um, our, our, our customers, our, our peers, our uh, ISPs, uh, system integrators. Oh, here goes my... Um, and uh, content providers uh, from the really big ones, from the Facebooks, the Netflixes, uh, the Akamai's of this world, uh, to the uh, ISPs, the smaller ones, uh, local, regional, but also the really big mobile ISPs like Reliance Joe in India, uh, who connects to us in, in Marseille, for example. Um, we built our network uh, with uh, stability in mind, uh, stability uh, between our pops, but also low latency. But sometimes the lowest latency doesn't always give you the most stable link, and so stability in combination with the lowest po possible latency has always been a driving uh, in that sense. And we're very geo-dispersed. Uh, as I said, we're in 105 carry neutral data centers in Europe. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, you'll see that uh, we're currently uh, connecting to a lot of local international and regional clouds across Europe and what that exactly means I'll, I'll show as well. So the title of this presentation is the road to a distributed interconnection ecosystem. That, that's quite a mouthful. That's a lot of marketing jargon in there and um, I wish we wouldn't use so many high-flying words but, but we do. Um, but we can dissect it a little bit. Uh, distributed, uh, we do not focus um, all our interconnection into one uh, location, uh, be it one data center or one metro area. No, we're in multiple data centers inside a metro, but also across Europe. Interconnection services. Uh, network operators traditionally try to transport you on their network from A to B. Um, we allow uh, our network to function as a piece in the middle, uh, whereby uh, a network provider can connect on one end and a network provider connects on another end and they build a VLAN across our backbone and um, they continue their service but they use us as a piece in the middle. 
Uh, the same with cloud. Uh, we provide connectivity towards cloud infrastructure, so, uh, such as uh, Microsoft Azure and Amazon AWS. But we also have customers that use us for peering, but at the same time also have a cloud service that they will w want to open to our uh, 600 plus customers. And so they build a VLAN for themselves that other customers can connect to. So it's, it's a fabric more than a network in that sense. An ecosystem, of course, I, I mentioned it already, uh, more and more we're starting to see that customers are leveraging our network to look at our member list, our customer list, which is transparent and online, and say, well, you know, I'm a DDoS mitigation provider. Um, if I build a VLAN across all your pubs uh, on, on your backbone, uh, quite cost efficiently, I can access all these, uh, these networks and they can use us and our services uh, for DDoS mitigation, whereby uh, when they're under attack, they uh, send us the prefixes, we announce them to the, the broader internet, yeah. but the scrub traffic, we use NLAX's infrastructure and send it over the VLAN back to the, the port, which is now freed up because the customer was peering before, but now when they're under attack, they shut down that traffic because the prefixes are now being announced by the DDoS mitigation provider and so on. So an ecosystem is starting to arise of customers selling and buying from other customers across our, our network footprint. So to talk a little bit about the distributed part, um, we, we see what, what we call a, the application journey. Um, uh, and it, it says it there, uh, enterprises in the beginning, and I'm talking about 1980, used to think that it would be much safer to keep all that hardware and all that software and all that data inside the own company in the basement um, with a single feed <laughs> and no air conditioning. Um, since then, we've learned a lot, of course. Um, th there have been a number of drivers that have pushed uh, the application outside of the enterprise. Um, and first, going to what was then available, and this is late 80s, early 90s, carrier-owned data centers, uh, such as NTT or BT or uh, Posca Telecom, uh, before it became Orange, perhaps. Uh, they would have their own data centers, and they would uh, allow their enterprise customers to come in and, um, and make use of this space because by then already the first enterprises started to see that building a data center or maintaining uh, air conditioning in your own enterprise uh, is quite difficult. Um, and space and power was more of a driver to go outside than interconnection. Um, then in the mid to late 90s, the, the carry neutral data center started to appear. And these were not owned by carriers, they were owned by individual operators. Equinix is the leading example, of course. And um, other companies in Europe, like Interaction, Telecity, uh, Redbus back then, uh, also appeared in the, on, on the scene and uh, have been joined by many, many operators since, uh, be it local or international, anything in the middle. Uh, but they offered their customers uh, a, a neutral place where carriers could come in and provide services to customers looking for these services, but not wanting vendor lock-in. Um, out of these carrier neutral data centers, because it's, again, it's a marketing term, and it's quite easy to call yourself carrier neutral, um, simply because you're not owned by a, a carrier. Um, but it means, of course, that you actually have to provide that, that choice to your customers. So out of that huge group of carrier neutral uh, uh, data centers, you saw up here uh, a leading group in each metro and per country and indeed globally uh, that, um, that started to um, um, uh, attract more networks than others. And uh, this hyper-connectivity um, attracted another type of customer that needed to interconnect their business with a, a large amount of other partners. Uh, for example, take a Netflix. Uh, they would go to a data center before they uh, uh, fulfilled their, their policy of uh, 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 caching their servers inside the eyeball networks, but they would also go to these data centers that have hyper-connectivity, connect to internet exchanges, connect directly to ISPs, small and large, uh, mobile operators, uh, and so on. Um, so from these hyper-connected data centers, another expansion grew, and Frankfurt is a good example of this, where you saw a campus all of a sudden appear in the middle of the city or on the edge of the city, where competing data centers, all professing to be carrier neutral, started to hub and bring an enormous amount of connectivity to the region, to the, the, the neighborhood, if you like, 
the campus of competing data centers. And in some cases, uh, even cloud providers with their server farms would uh, join in and, and build next to that. Uh, everything is driven, of course, by price and availability and uh, the availability of power. But uh, this is indeed something uh, that you see. Um, then a bit of a jump towards 2015, 2016. This is when, when uh, clouds really started to break through in the enterprise market. Uh, here goes the... Um, and you see uh, enterprises opt for an OPEX model rather than a CAPEX model. Nobody wants to own and run servers anymore themselves if they can get it uh, in a matter of minutes from a Amazon or from, uh, from Microsoft. Um, this meant that uh, for their own interconnection strategy, these cloud providers were looking at these same hyper-connected data centers and see, well, where can we build on ramps to our clouds, uh, like you have Azure Express routes, you have um, um, you have uh, a Direct Connect from Amazon. Um, these are pops that provide bridges and highways into their clouds directly outside of the internet, um, because in many countries uh, the model of going all out across the internet and just tunnel into this big cloud wasn't seen as extremely safe to some legal departments. Uh, so for compliance reasons, these, these direct connect pops were born and uh, they started to cluster into these hyper-connected data centers as well. But this starts to create a new breed of data centers whereby the original focus on uh, carry neutrality and freedom of choice of network provider, now all of a sudden it starts to shift focus towards the enterprise market and offering instead of internet exchanges, for example, starts to offer cloud exchanges. Uh, to attract and lock in uh, these, um, these enterprise customers. And now, something that's starting to happen and, and will start to continue to proliferate going forward is um, you see the full adoption of cloud, but also the adoption of multi-cloud. And this means that uh, enterprises, still not happy with vendor lock-in, will look to, uh, to not just um, make use of Azure, but also want to use uh, Amazon or SoftLayer or Google Cloud uh, for whatever reason, or maybe later uh, AliCloud when it arrives in, in, in Europe uh, for, for certain applications or for certain uh, workloads. Um, this means that a company would then have to be able to switch between these clouds and what better to do from one data center. But what if that one data center doesn't have all these clouds on ramps? Uh, so you need a strategy then that connects you to multiple data centers. So it becomes quite complex. Um, the complexity actually goes a little bit further because I'm talking about a simple, single enterprise premise that needs to be connected to one cloud and then to multiple clouds, but many larger corporations where this is really, where this is in play, uh, are also looking to um, connect their entire private network of uh, offices across a country or uh, a region uh, or indeed globally as well. So then you see that you need to uh, be able to address uh, enterprise customers that connect in, 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 in Paris, in London, in, in, in Warsaw, and not just to Amazon, but also to a soft layer and so on. So it becomes extremely complex once you enter this multi-cloud, geo-dispersed uh, adventure. And of course, with all this, the latency becomes extremely important because everybody working across all these offices needs to be guaranteed the same uh, time to, to, to download data or to, uh, uh, to run applications. So Gartner has spoken about this as well and they themselves see that those customers, those enterprise customers that are uh, adopting this interconnection model whereby they put part of their infrastructure into uh, these co-location uh, facilities and from there on connect their networks into clouds, multi-clouds. Um, those will be the ones that they see will, uh, will come up uh, as winners in the coming uh, 20 years. And um, uh, well, the, the quote speaks for itself, I think. So, an ecosystem. Um, 
I mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, when you're talking about multi-cloud, it really, you need to get away from the abstract and just look at your own practice. Like uh, many people use uh, IA infrastructure as a service uh, platforms like, uh, like Azure or like Amazon, but many of us also work with Salesforce or we use Google Mail or we use any kind of local administration application. We use calendaring. Uh, all these things are, are now more or less cloud-based. Uh, which means that if you still try to adhere to your own compliancy, your own uh, uh, rules for, for low latency, security, as an enterprise, you will have to connect to a multitude of clouds. Um, and this, in fact, is a, an example of these clouds. These are some of the clouds that we connect to uh, for our customers, um, close to 50, I, I believe, at the moment. And it's really difficult to identify exactly who we add to this list because many of our customers, if you would ask them themselves, they see themselves as a cloud service provider. But we, we try to go for the bigger ones and uh, this is what we came up with. And this means that these can be connected to us anywhere in Europe. It doesn't uh, specifically uh, say where they are connected. Um, but using our network, um, our customers, wherever they are located and in whatever data center they connect to us from, uh, they can be reached, and that, again, outside of the internet at a low, stable latency. So you have a number of ways to reach these clouds. And if you look at the, 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 the furthest column, you see transport. These are the direct <coughs> connects. These are the own interconnects that we have established with the larger cloud providers, like Azure and like Amazon. Um, but in some cases, like for example, for Office 365, it's very difficult to establish the direct interconnect. In fact, Microsoft sort of push, pushes back on this. Um, but it's still uh, holed up in an ASN run by Microsoft. So <coughs> if you, as a company, start to look at your own AS, uh, if you don't have it yet, if you're an enterprise customer, maybe build an AS for that. Um, or if your service provider that connects to us uh, has an AS, they can use the peering, of course, with Microsoft that serves Office 365 out of that AS. Not the top of my head, but maybe 8075 uh, could be that AS. Um, so transport is one way, peering is another way, and of course transit uh, is, is, is a third option. Um, we sell transit to smaller ISPs because they ask us uh, to do it. We deliver that on the same port as peering services, which is also not a best practice, I guess. Uh, but in, in, in many cases, especially if you're smaller, uh, cost wins uh, the, 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 the best practices. Um, and that's just the way it is. And, and similarly, these clouds, w w which are all housed and accessible across the, the public internet, can be accessed using transit as well. The difference is that instead of sending that traffic across the public internet to uh, upstream providers, we simply connect to uh, them at the closest uh, direct connect pop or at the closest peering location where they have it so that we maintain as much as possible that uh, security by transporting it uh, for the most part over our private network and then um, handing it off uh, based on a peering relationship. Now, a quick look at uh, some of the players in this, uh, this interconnection ecosystem. Because no matter how you look at it, we're all sort of moving in this, uh, in this direction. And let's start in the left with uh, the incumbent exchanges, as, as, as we call them. Uh, the, uh, the first generation internet exchanges, uh, Plix uh, uh, is an example of this. In other uh, countries, you have DKIX, M6 Lynx. Um, they can offer some of these cloud peering services, as we call them, because they have some of these uh, broader uh, cloud providers connected to their internet exchange. And so their clouds can be reached using a peering relationship. Um, but of course, they, they can't sell the transit uh, part in case you don't want to become a member of an exchange and, and, and set up peering just for the sake of reaching a cloud. Um, of course, they're not distributed at all. Uh, they're focused on, on one specific city, in some cases on one specific data center. Um, in some cases, they're not DC neutral. Uh, some exchanges are operated by 
uh, for example, data center operators as well. Um, typically, they would be wholesale focused, and typically, they wouldn't have access to business market. Um, depending on the data center operator, uh, many data center operators today are still chock full with uh, network service providers that still had the biggest driver to go to that data center was the uh, existence of an internet exchange and to interconnect IP traffic on a wholesale level. So many of these data center operators don't have the, uh, the actual end customer, the enterprise customer inside their data center. This is changing rapidly now. And in some cases, they're pushing out some of the wholesale uh, parties because retail sells at a higher margin. Um, so you have cloud-enabled data centers. These are typically data centers that, uh, that offer one or, or multiple access pops to the bigger clouds, um, but uh, have no ability to, to offer a peering uh, path into these clouds. Um, they're not distributed. Uh, typically, they're not neutral. They can be seen as walled gardens. Um, and again, not necessarily access to the business market. Then the next one, the carriers, the, the network operators uh, of the olden days. Um, this, is, uh, this is typically difficult. Uh, they are definitely dis distributed. Uh, they are typically not uh, DC neutral because they operate their own small data centers where they would like to sell you their services. Um, but a big advantage that they do have is they have access to the uh, business market. Uh, long established, uh, Bigger national companies would have a, a relationship, very deep relationship in some countries with the national incumbent, uh, Telco, for example. Um, other global telecom operators uh, service multinational companies, for example. So they definitely have that business market access, but they lag in, in the other uh, segments. Then um, you have the, uh, the interconnect providers. Uh, these are the megaports, the consoles, the, uh, the packet fabric even uh, of, of this world, uh, the epsilons. Um, these connect to cloud exchanges. Uh, they are somewhat distributed. Uh, it follows their own network footprint. Uh, they're definitely DC neutral. Um, the stability in the low latency of their network it, is linked directly to their own network. And um, again, oh, these players typically lack, uh, lack the, uh, the access to business market as well. And then, obviously, marketing was involved in the creation of this slide. Then you have the interconnect exchange itself. Uh, this is um, the tagline on our logo. So this is us. Um, you see that we tick most of these boxes. But again, also, and this is a challenge for us as well, uh, we need to uh, find a way through partners, uh, through resellers, and through customers that use us to build solutions for their customers, um, access the business market. And then at the end, you have the integrators and the cloud application providers. Integrators would buy most of these services to, to get to these clouds. Uh, they can be seen as our customers and, and other uh, mentioned uh, providers, uh, customers. Um, and of course, they have a very intimate relationship with these business market customers. And then the cloud pro application providers themselves, uh, a small, small minority like Amazon, like uh, Salesforce, like an Oracle, they have their own interconnection and their own network strategies. But the majority, and you only have to look at the Polish market, and I'm not very familiar with the Polish market, but you'll have bookkeeping software companies. They don't really have an interconnection strategy at this stage. Uh, some of them may, but the majority may, may not. And there's all these typical business applications that are now moving to a cloud, but that's it. And how to reach you? Well, by the internet. Um, and what about compliance? Uh, so they would have to shop for a CDN, which can now be called an ADN, uh, application delivery network provider that can help them uh, get to these end customers uh, in, a, in, a, in a more secure and a more low latency way. And of course, these sell directly to these business customers, so that's uh, where they have an advantage. But this is a little bit the, uh, the ecosystem drawn out. And this was my presentation. If you have any questions, we have a stand uh, on the first floor. 
and uh, I'll be here all day. So thank you. Is there any questions? No concrete uh, <laughs> life. Uh, <laughs> all right, thank you.